tackling the issues of complexity and they have a lot of material uh, reference books uh, suggested and papers suggested and a lot of very nice lectures um, you know seminars are recorded and put and put up there there is a tool they use is called complexity explorer it's like a portal really for uh, you know to gather all their activities they have a lot of courses tutorials it's very nice okay um, so I hope that gives some indication of where you could start uh, well you're welcome to contact us if you are you know if you develop some interest and we are tr trying already to um, you know have a collaboration starting between IIT KZP and Trinity with Professor Das so we have a couple of interns uh, at the moment in my lab in Dublin and they are working on these issues okay so hopefully they will be back and I guess give a seminar or that's a very good way to interact because they're good proxies right they've been there working on this for a couple of months so they will know definitely quite a bit by then by the time they come back so uh, in any event feel free to feel free to contact me if you have an interest or a doubt so um, I first want to basically introduce the field of syst uh, complex systems a bit more generally and then from next lecture on we are going a bit deeper into uh, how we can apply it to communication networks okay so the, um, there is a big deal, a, a great deal of philosophy also involved, uh, at least philosophy of science involved in how you tackle systems uh, with the tools of complexity uh, as compared to what has been done so far uh, in mo most of the scientific endeavor, okay? Um, so by some people this is considered like a um, buzzword, okay? There is always... Uh, um, part of the community that regards new concepts as uh, uh, rubbish, right? And they, they, they basically say this is, has been seen before, which to some extent is probably a bit true, and or they say, you know, it's lo just blah, blah, blah. Uh, so there is, there, is, there is a component, you know, of the, of the scientific community that doesn't really buy these concepts. And then there is another community which uh, loves the concepts and I try to keep an open mind. I, I think it's nice set of tools, and you know there are many nice things you can do. But you know, uh, again, it's 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 a tool, so I, I take it as it is. If it's useful to what I try to investigate, good. If not, I I can always change. So far, it gives it gave me good indications that you can do good work and you can get good insights on communication networks. Okay, so um, in in a certain sense. Uh, there is actually, I'm going back to this, but there is philosophically uh, an approach to science which has been very successful so far, which is different than what I'm, use, I'm talking about here. It's like the reductionist approach. So you basically decompose a system into its uh, simplest parts, and then understanding the simplest parts will give you an understanding of the system as, as a whole. Uh, and you basically say that the system is simply the sum of its parts, okay, and uh, nothing beyond that. And it's been very successful, for example, in physics, okay? That's why there is a lot of attention to elementary particles, right? You go really to the uh, 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 very s uh, smallest components of reality and then, or, you know, that's, for example, how we design an engineering system, usually, right? You design all the different cogs and, and uh, you know, parts, and then you put them together and they work. And you don't expect the system to have any crazy behavior. It has been designed so that you, you know, the different components put together will give uh, uh, rise to some behavior, right? So it has been very, very productive. Though uh, some aspects of reality or, you know, um, even of, of the technological, uh, you know, systems we deal with, you can't really capture with this approach. So imagine, for example, um, a flock of birds Okay, I, if you just focus on, um, or even better, a, a colony of ants, if you just focus on a single component of that system, you will hardly understand how the structure that the system shows at a higher scale is that complicated, right? If you just observe a single ant, you will not get much of an idea how they can create so, so complicated structures or, you know, banks of uh, fish, or even, you know, if you consider a, a, a huge uh, city, you know, like Kolkata, and you just observe what a certain person does, hardly you can imagine how, you know, the, the things can be so complex and so intertwined, you know, and, and, uh, and so on. So there are some aspects which actually are not really following 
this um, paradigm where you go into the smallest components and yet you sum all the part you sum all the parts and then you get the, the understanding of, of the global behavior um, other example you, you probably experience it when studying in a group R rarely the putting together different minds gives rise to something that is just a sum right it might actually be a disaster things might work out terribly and you get nothing out of it right uh, or the opposite the people really work uh, you know in synergy and you get much better outcome than if you had these persons individually working and then some in the output right so there are uh, some you know more scientific explanations some more intuitive explanations but there are some things that are actually not captured by the normal approach to uh, to science okay um, so there are uh, uh, other things for example that I studied normally with the um, um, uh, help of statistical mechanics if you just observe a small atom in a substance rare diff it's very difficult that just you know considering all the atoms you might get the global picture even impossible at, at, at times so you would have you would have a statistical approach and they would have some global properties that come out of the local behavior and interactions right so it has been done already all right right in for example when you study the property of gases you you don't adopt this uh, some of the part uh, approach right you you adopt a more holistic uh, view to the, to the system um, now uh, what what professor da silva said last week about game theory it is true about uh, complex system science in a sense it's not one thing it's a collection of things okay it's a set of tools that are very diverse between them they have very different purposes and you have to pick uh, you know um, based on the problem you're tackling what you need so it's not that any tool will be good for anything of course you have to develop some experience you have to see you know what has been done before and what you can learn from that and you know there are some tools that are very rigorous we're going to see some of them are really like information theoretical some tools are much more software based okay and you you basically very simple so you just uh, uh, give some very simple rules to an agent and then a, co a collectivity of agents will give rise to some global behavior um, some things are actually have been there for a while but never applied in the context of um, you know uh, real networks like graph theory and graph theory is something we can use and we will use here too uh, but you know there is a new like take on uh, how this can actually model networks of practical relevance and how for example you can model the dynamics so graph theory is more like you have a certain deployment right in a sense of nodes uh, even if it's not really a deployment collection of nodes and then you study for example how uh, much uh, how many connections there are in a certain region how far uh, how long is uh, on average a path to get from a node to another node how much a certain node is connected to the other nodes on average right and and so on and so forth there is a whole set of of metrics uh, that if you studied or you at least you got some you, you had some interest in graph theory you might be familiar with now the difference in uh, in uh, in the approach we take uh, here it's, it's a subset of the complex systems approach it's called network science you basically study uh, real networks there is a big deal also to study phase transitions of the systems um, dynamics of the networks are also important and these are things that traditionally are not captured by graph theory okay um, Missing. Uh, yeah, there is another subset uh, of, of the studies which have to do, and it's s tightly intertwined with dynamical system with uh, chaos theory and fractal geometry. Okay, so it looks like that the, um, if you plot, for example, the, f uh, the phase state of a, of a certain system, at some point it will repeat itself, okay, in a, at different scales, which is the behavior of a fractal. So um, there are many things you can do. So for example, in our group, we did uh, study definitely things uh, related to information theoretical aspects of complexity. We did study things um, related to the computational aspects. So applying this um, agent-based modeling or cellular automata uh, to basically get a certain global behavior out of a local uh, set of rules. 
and we did study in collaboration with the mathematics department in um, in Trinity uh, an application of statistical mechanics uh, in the context of network science. Now we didn't tackle so far uh, the dynamical systems aspects, so Kell theory, fractal geometry, and, and so on. This is a big part of, of this. It differs from the traditional um, dynamical systems uh, in the sense that here we are talking about nonlinear uh, dynamics. Okay, so it's uh, it's not the usual thing you study, for example, in automation, where you have a linear input output relation a lot of what we do here implies that you have a feedback loop okay and when you have a feedback loop immediately you become nonlinear right because even if you have uh, y equals uh, ax x is the input and uh, y is the output if you feed it back what do you get you get uh, a times what comes back right and uh, and so on and so forth so you you basically um, start to get I mean uh, a nonlinearity right in the in the in the approach um, okay so um, basically uh, much of what we do uh, in uh, in um, communication systems has this feedback in involved right <coughs> so we want uh, definitely many of the things you do are dealing with doing something gauging what's happening and then getting some report back and then acting again okay so the traditional uh, linear uh, dynamical linear system approach is not going to help you too much with this and it's no big surprise that if you look at it uh, so far there has been very little interaction between communication um, the communication engineering community and the control engineering community very little discussion it's a bit surprising because there would be a lot of room for collaborations and so on. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so, so possibly not so surprising if you consider that the, um, the kind of systems we deal with in, in terms of evolution over time are highly nonlinear, at least especially the modern ones, which have a lot of feedback involved. Yeah. Okay. Um, Now, um, the, the, the concept of complexity is uh, highly related to the concept of information and uh, therefore to the concept of entropy. If you look at the more formal definition of correct information theory, and uh, some people go even a bit further and they say um, that basically it's possibly possible that information, so and any, any derivation that comes out of it, including complexity, might be the third fundamental quantity underpinning the universe, right? You have mass and energy, as we know, and but there is a lot to do with the information, okay? There are uh, very good, um, uh, you know, uh, discussions, if not uh, complete works, about the relation between, for example, uh, the entropy in the thermodynamical sense and the entropy in the information theoretical sense. They are highly related, okay? If you consider, for example, the Boltzmann concept of entropy and you check how we define entropy according to Shannon they very much look alike okay uh, now th there are differences but there are also similarities um, some other people say for example that uh, a lot has to do with basically everything in the physical reality could be represented as um, an encoding scheme right if you have enough memory possibly you could describe anything with bits right you can say, uh, of course, you have to have a very large memory and uh, v a lot of knowledge, but you could possibly encode everything, right? So in a sense, if you want, information is even more fundamental than the other things we see around. Hmm? There are even studies about, uh, you know, pre-Big ba pre Bang things, okay? How comes that eventually things kind of, uh, you know, were rolled out in that way, right? After the Big Bang, it was just, you know, uh, it's like it's as if the universe knew what to do, right? Uh, either you believe in luck, and I'm not very, uh, very fond of that, or there must have been some sort of a plan, right? Without even going supernatural, and it can simply mean, you know, that there was kind of encoded set of instructions, and things were just rolling, right? Um, uh, and you know, there there could be some, as you have like. Um, you know, uh, genetic code. There could have been a cosmological code, right? Uh, which basically encoded everything. So again, 
It's a lot to do with bits. There is a very nice um, uh, documentary uh, online. Uh, I think it's still online. Um, uh, it's actually produced by BBC4, and it's called uh, possibly the information, I think. And it, it does talk about these things, okay, how the concept of information, in a sense, is omnipresent. So um, if you want, it could be that Shannon, when it, ga it gave birth to information theory, it kind of, it was solving a specific problem for a telecom network, but it looks like it's much more than that. Information theory has been applied in many different fields, and from what I'm telling you, I'm not a physicist, okay, I'm just reporting what, uh, what I, I heard about, it looks like it would be much, much more than what we are used to. So get away from the idea. And what I'm going to talk about in the next few lectures is just about communication networks. Okay, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. But uh, the field of uh, information and complexity is much, much broader. So there are, in fact, traditionally the some of the concepts we use have been published in um, physics uh, review. Uh, um, or, you know, there are... Uh, we, we, we did submit a recent work to a statistical mechanics journal and application. So it's a highly interdisciplinary field from the, you know, uh, by design even, if you want. So there are many different communities that come together. Traditionally, it has been in the beginning physicists um, and uh, computer scientists, m very active. Uh, but, you know, that, that has been now kind of, you know, going into biology. In fact, some people consider one of the... Um, birthplaces, if you want, of, of complex systems um, uh, science. One paper from Alan Turing, 1952. I think it's called the morphogenesis of a chemical system, something like this. So what he was doing was basically deriving equations that would explain why some animals would develop these kind of patterns on their furs, right, like zebras or stuff like this. So he basically proposed a model that, starting from very simple rules, uh, you know, uh, would basically lead to these emerging properties, okay? So another example, another uh, person that has been um, working uh, since the early uh, days on, on these things um, has been a Russian scientist, the name escapes me now, and basically was showing that if you uh, mix two chemical elements, like liquid, uh, in the liquid state, um, so basically, um, taken them, uh, taken uh, separately, they would be inert. They would not do anything. But mixed together, they would um, give rise to something amazing. So you would have like the li a new, new uh, set of properties. And basically, the, um, the liquid would oscillate. So it would be becoming, would give rise, for example, at some point it would be a certain color. And then it would become of another color. And then of the former color. And again, like uh, by oscillatory system, OK? And he submitted his works and his results was a you know a serious uh, scientist and it, it was rejected. And he said, "You fabricated the results. There's not such a thing. Cannot exist." Okay, and the guy even left science altogether. Okay, so in the beginning, and Turing, you might know, he didn't have much better fortune, right? He, he was really like uh, helping his country to win the war, and because of sexual orientation, he was basically disintegrated by his own uh, society that he helped to to keep alive, right? So it's a sad history in the beginning, but you know, the good ideas don't die. People die, the good ideas don't. So people kept, you know, working on this and uh, to, you know, to, to bear witness that this is a serious field. I think, you know, compared to some people say it's crap, there is a, mm -hmm. one of the main scientists and co-founders of the Santa Fe Institute is this uh, Nobel physicist, Marie Zellman. So they're very serious people that are interested in this, in this field, okay? Um, no, it's a very broad philosophical introduction. I have to give you a bit more details. No? Some of the nanotechnology would also come into the realm of the complexity when you refer to the physics at the nano level. Correct. I, I think there, there might be something there. I didn't, uh, I didn't do work on that. I'm not a nanotechnologist. Uh, the, I suppose, you know, the, if I think like the application of statistical mechanics, there might be something to do with uh, how small uh, elements combine themselves in some way, but I cannot comment too much on that. There's a very good group working on nanotechnologies in Trinity, but I don't know if they do they do things in this domain. I know it has been applied in uh, financial market analysis, for example. 
to some extent successfully and then uh, city planning has been there um, I think it has been yeah there is something going on in biology definitely computer science uh, physics more interested in the maybe fundamentals um, so there is a, a growing community actually um, so uh, in a sense if you want to put all the systems in in one picture you would have something like this so you you move from simple to systems that are not so simple to systems that are complex to systems that are chaotic okay and you have an increase in degree of uncertainty going towards chaotic systems and in and, and uh, an increase in disagreement going towards chaotic systems which means but for the simple systems, there is not much um, arguments. Uh, there is there is not much debate. Okay, we we kind of understand them. Um, and is, if you increase the complexity, and at some point you even you know cross what is called the edge of chaos, there is much less agreement, and we kind of really don't understand them. Um, there are some things that have to, do, for example, with the evolution of the chaotic system, which have. Um, a very nice uh, geometric representation in the fractal geometry space and these have been considered for quite a while by mathematicians themselves monsters something that should not be there doesn't make sense okay so they, you have you start to have like um, if you I don't know if you I, I give you like a, a small homework you check the, there are some videos showing the zooming in of the Mandelbrot set it's a fractal uh, set mind-blowing it's absolutely mind-blowing. Right? It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. It's like, you know, you, you keep zooming and you keep seeing new structures. And everything is originated by an equation like this. Same goes with chaotic systems. You have, they are deterministic in nature because you have an equation describing them. But basically in the system itself, there is kind of a very random nature. So it's kind of both random and deterministic at the same uh, time. Okay, and, uh, and uh, there are very big surprises. You have dimensions that are not integer numbers. You have, a, you have the Hausdorff, for example, dimension. You start to have dimensions that are real numbers. What does it mean? I mean it's difficult to say, right? Um, an example of a fractal is a tree. If you, if you take a small, uh, you know, if you take a picture of a tree and then you, you take a smaller part, you, take, you zoom in, you continuously see the same structure. You have kind of a trunk and then branches. Right, and then the branch itself. If you zoom it, uh, zoom it in, it's a trunk, and then branches, and so on. So, uh, the way, for example, coastlines uh, behave, it's again kind of a fractal. So, um, it, it's it's possibly very much uh, part of the of the fabric of, of the world. Okay, so it's it's much much present actually. Um, and uh, one thing that characterizes chaotic systems is. Uh, what is uh, commonly called the butterfly effect and this uh, in mathematical jargon you'll say it's a system which is sensitively dependent on initial conditions as the IC which simply means even if you know everything okay the the, the Mandelbrot set or you know other things uh, that um, you know that uh, basically um, you know the equation describing the system uh, the, the best example that they normally make is called logistic map it's mm, uh, used, for example, to model how a certain population of animals, um, you know, uh, grow or uh, decrease in a certain space, given some resources. So there is a simple equation, second, uh, second degree equation. And um, so basically, you know, you can, uh, you can have these, uh, you know, um, being plotted and then you would have different behaviors according to how you change certain value of a parameter in some cases perfectly predictable some other cases is not very predictable okay uh, and chaotic so the problem with chaotic system is that even if you have an equation and you change a tiny bit the initial condition you might end up after a few iterations in a completely unexpected trajectory of the phase uh, state okay and then you could say, okay, then I become more precise, right? And then, again, I should get rid of this problem. The problem is you can never be absolutely precise. You measure, right? There is an equation, fine, but the reality is different. So how are you sure that you actually measure correctly the initial condition? At some point, you run out of precision with your instruments, right? How many uh, zeros? 10, 20? At some point, you stop, right? It's even too small, basically. And that is enough for the system to... Uh, be completely unpredictable in the uh, after some point so you you will get better better 
uh, at the short term predictions if you get more precise in the initial condition measurement but it will become at some point anyway impossible to track that's the problem behind why the weather forecast is so bad right you don't trust the weather forecast beyond two or three days normally it's because they are dealing with the chaotic systems um, okay the boundary conditions are very difficult to define so there are um, now one interesting question could be uh, we didn't tackle that what if a certain communication system is chaotic well the implication would be in a sense uh, very drastic very radical because it could be that you have to give up uh, long-term control on your system the best you can hope for it's some you know you can see what's going on up to some point in time and you cannot go beyond that so that would be the in a sense the horizon uh, uh, right in the in the design and then you would have to to re refresh in a sense the your your planning right because beyond that you cannot be sure what's going to happen so there could be big implications uh, if this was the case. We didn't study that yet, though. Okay. Uh, there are a few characteristics. I don't want to go into much detail, uh, but you know there are some uh, things that define a complex adaptive system. Some people use the term adaptive. Um, some people don't. I think it's, in a sense, when you talk about a complex system, it's it is adaptive. Okay. It's a system that takes into account what happens in the environment and then. Uh, changes and evolves accordingly. Um, yeah, these nonlinearity is uh, basically very, very much interrelated with what I just discussed about the sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Emergence is what I said before that local and uh, you know uh, interactions give rise to um, global behaviors. Okay, like in the case, for example, of a flock of birds. A certain bird, I mean, there is no bird commanding all the other birds, right? It's not like a, uh, uh, um, an army, right? So you do have, I mean, the best they can do is to check what the, the neighbor is doing. If the neighbor is kind of swerving right, then the, the bird would do the same, period. There's nothing else. But then you start, you start to see how the birds move. I don't know if you ever observed that or watched videos. It's impressive. It's like a very light blanket, right? Doing all sorts of evolutions in the sky. And if you just observe one bird, no way you can predict now imagine you never saw a flock of birds and you saw a single bird would you ever guess that it can give rise to this so when when the, when the answer is no or at least you're not so sure that's a good sign that there might be an emergent phenomenon right or if you just observe a few particles you will never guess the whole um, um, gas uh, system behavior right you cannot uh, for example, guess the temperature or the pressure and so on, right? Um, it does mean that the system changes with time, okay? And uh, possibly in a very turbulent and rapid and, and uh, unpredictable way, okay? So it, uh, if you have a system which of which you can for forecast perfectly the behavior from now till eternity, that's not a complex system. You know all about it, okay? Uh, about its evolution. When that's not the case, then that's an indication normally it is a complex system. So this is not a very mathematical definition. It's like some characteristics, okay, which might or might not be there. It's a system that adapts, as we said, to the environment. There is some uh, basically uh, degree of uncertainty, okay, in the possible outcomes it can take, and it co evolve so between basically sub parts of the system or between systems or even between the system and the environment okay so there is a coevolution so you react to uh, for example what other uh, parts of the system do and you do evolve together okay if you have any comment or question let me know okay um, so there are a few views uh, about what a complex system is so some people say that a system is complex when it has many parts and they are interconnected in an intricate uh, way. So the here we focus on the number of the um, uh, parts of the system and how they interconnect. Uh, now, in my uh, opinion, the number won't tell you so much. Okay, yeah, it's sort of an indication, but what is more interesting is how the different um, parts of the system are related. Okay, for example, I give you an example of a system that uh, is composed by many parts, but is not complex at all. 
probably is not even a system. Uh, if you have a collection of, uh, of teacups, say you are a collector of teacups and you have a thousand of them, is this system any complex? Does it do anything interesting? It's not even a system, right? Does it do anything? So the number itself won't tell you too much, okay? Mm -hmm. But the relation between the, the components, that's what is interesting, okay? Because that's what leads to some emerging phenomena. So when you, for example, you see the birds, it's not the number of birds that makes the difference. It's actually how they communicate, how they relate. So if you look at the colony of ants, it's how they talk to each other that is important, not how many ants you have in the system, right? Um, and again, there is a bit of magic here, honestly. It's not super well understood how from these small scale behaviors you, you actually get to the global ones. I don't think there is a theory yet, okay? There is a, some understanding, there are some tools. You can actually engineer if you want a network like that already. Uh, for example, with uh, Asian based modeling, we, we are going to see an example, but that's not like saying I have an equation telling you, okay, how the thing evolves, and I'm not sure we'll ever get there, okay? Uh, but you have some, uh, you, for example, what, what you can do is to identify some rules that work better than others. That you can do, okay? Um, yeah, the relation between cause and effect is subtle. Normally, yeah, there is, of course. It's not that this violates any, causal, any causality, but it's not like I do this, therefore I get that. Especially if you go wider in space, and especially if you go uh, towards a longer time horizon. No way you can get this clear understanding with a complex system, okay? Um, yeah, the emergent behavior already discussed about, um, so a complex system has a set of different elements that are connected or related in a way that they can perform a function which is not performable by the elements alone. So if you take the elements of a complex system in isolation, they will not be able to do what they do as, as, a, as an ensemble, okay? Um, and uh, like this also you know, points to another thing, which I'm not going to touch too much in this course, but it's very, very important for complex systems, which is the multi-scale situation. So you do have, uh, like to define a system as complex is very much dependent on the scale, okay? For example, if you have uh, the solar system, you have basically a big ball, which is the sun, and then other small balls, which uh, revolve around, right? I don't know what is your definition of complex. It doesn't look too complex to me, right? You can build a model yourself, like probably you did it as a kid, right? And it will work. Uh, now, what is becoming very com complex, though, is when you start to zoom in and look in the different planets or the sun itself or even the Earth, even worse. And then, at that scale, things are very complex and not so predictable. But at the broader scale, more or less everything we know, right? So the scale is very, very important at which you look uh, a phenomenon or a system. Um, there is, uh, now don't mix up what we are going to call complexity in this, um, in this uh, uh, course with other forms of complexity like time complexity, computational complexity, which you heard about. That's something else, okay? Uh, that's that's uh, measures somehow some aspects of complexity, but it's not what, what we are going to, to talk about. And another thing we'll see is that uh, normally, uh, complexity is basically something that appears between order and disorder. So you do have a complex system uh, when you have some sort of intelligent structure in a certain space, but not a very dull structure. So for example, if you think of a checkerboard, that's not really a complex pattern, okay? Because you kind of know, once you know uh, a small template, you can just copy and paste the template. And Neither is complex a random pattern. Hmm? Though for some definition of complexity, that's also complex. We are going back to that. But the complexity appears when you are neither in this very structured order environment nor in the random situation. So in between is where you will likely see high levels of complexity. Hmm? So this is a, a nice figure, I think, which kind of summarizes many of the things I said. So uh, a complex system involves few components, normally many, 
uh, they are dynamically interacting and they give rise to a number of scales and they do obtain a certain behavior um, which is called an, normally an emergent behavior okay so there is a big part of um, um, I mean there is a big part to do with um, with this organization of the systems but also with the time scale so normally they tend to evolve to a more in interesting structure okay um, and another thing we know is that the fine scales influence the large scale behavior and that's part of the chaos study okay so if you have um, some systems actually it's very important uh, to be very fine in the scale uh, you study because that could influence okay the the large scale behaviors um, yeah, I think that's more or less it for th Is this actually a focus to the solar system technology? Like yes. Like here, the subatomic level is, is considered as a simple system. Correct. Uh, yes, but again, I didn't say that uh, it goes one way. What I'm saying is that the scale matters. Okay, so it is scale dependent. You're right. In some systems, it, mi it might go actually, I it's a bit of both because I think if you look at the. Um, astronomic level and you go towards say a planetary level you go towards what I said before but if you go from elementary particles up you're probably right it's simpler and we have very good models to understand the subatomic interactions and so on right so it's kind of but the main message is that the scale matters okay I'm not saying that increasing the scale or reducing the scale it goes according with the complexity okay I'm just saying that the complexity will be different Uh, well, uh, basically, you know, if, if you look at the global picture, okay, so you will have some level of complexity and entropy. If you look at the smaller scale, you will have another one. Now, in some cases, it might be higher. In some cases, it might be lower. We don't know. It depends on the system, okay? The only thing that matters, though, is the, in this discussion is that you have to define your scale before it makes sense to talk about complexity, okay? For example, when you talk about uh, common network, just to make it more concrete, you know, uh, you will have different, likely we didn't study that, but our assumption is that you will have different values of complexity and entropy and so on, and information if you have a device level interaction, so the device stands alone and just senses things, or if you have a link, or if you have a cluster, or if you have a network. Very likely, you will not have the same metrics, okay? And our main goal, maybe I should have said that in the beginning, is not to study complex systems per se is hopefully to use the understanding of a communication system as complex to design it better okay we will have we already have some evidence that um, uh, you know uh, if you have a more a higher value of complexity the system behaves better okay we're going back to that so if you could somehow engineer we don't know yet how to do it the system to have a um, an increasing level of complexity with time you might lead to better performance okay um, it has been applied, the complexity theory, in few fields. So as, as I mentioned before, uh, other examples besides telecom, which we're going to cover uh, later, transportation systems, okay, um, dynamic markets. And uh, for example, uh, in this sense, like even in terms of organization, I I the, the, the complex systems approach is very much bottom up, okay? So you basically have some uh, good things happening at the lower level and th this propagate uh, all over the, um, the system that could be beneficial some people say to the way you organize a company okay instead of having the classical approach where you have the boss which decides more or less everything I'm not sure how you would apply this to the army honestly but it, it's, it's possible maybe to, to, uh, to some extent to apply it in another organization okay what is the problem of having a boss or a central uh, controller? The problem is that the system is limited by the complexity of the controller itself. There is only so much the boss can process, right? So that will limit the scalability of the system. So this is true, no matter whether you talk about complex systems or not, at some point it will break down, right? That's why dictatorships normally don't last forever, because if there is only one guy in charge, at some point it's simply too much, right? And it's a much better idea, in fact, to have a more distributed approach, right? Which is in nature what complex systems try to do. 
you even nature works that way because I mean you don't have uh, in nature uh, well you do have a boss but you know the, the the interactions even in any community but the interactions are I mean it, the boss doesn't guide all the possible actions right there is some local level of decision making which then gives rise to to global patterns right it works better hmm? this this if you read any book on theory of organizations you will probably find similar concepts okay so um, a big a big concept uh, which is relevant to complex systems is the concept of emergence and it simply means how to study how mac macroscopic behavior arises from microscopic behavior so um, this is a definition from a, um, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and uh, so basically there are some properties at the higher level of, of the of the abstraction um, of the hierarchy in the system which uh, arise out of more fundamental entities okay so they arise from those entities but yet they are novel and not reducible to those elements so what I'm trying to say is that even though everything of course is you know is coming from the same subparts of the system so the global behavior is originated by those the properties you will see at the higher level the global level will not be immediately or even possibly reducible to the smaller parts so there are new properties which wouldn't be there if you know you didn't have these interactions and you likely can't have an equation telling you how you got there hmm? um, now the father of uh, genetic algorithms who is also one of the founders of this Santa Fe Institute I mentioned about uh, is saying that something like emergence is uh, it's unlikely that will submit to a concise definition and he said I have no such definition to offer uh, my experience again is that uh, many things to do with complex systems don't have yet a very precise definition. Some things have, some things don't. Um, but again, you know, to us, they sh we should just adopt it or discard it according to the needs. So we are we are not, at least not not yet. In my case, complex scientists, okay, complex system scientists. We are just telecom engineers trying to look for possible tool to solve some of the problems we have okay and to some extent this has been successful so far um, there is a much grander challenge for the people that are really working in the field of complexity is like to in a sense substitute much of the current scientific theories with these new approaches okay and then the problem you have compared to for example Newtonian mechanics and all the traditional scientific theories is that you have a much lesser much less uh, equations to show for the moment it's more empirical things you know understanding and uh, some observations that you know kind of give some picture but you don't have a very uh, you don't have a unique body of equations like electromagnetism so we are still far from that okay um, now Irving Schrodinger some of you might know because of the cat some of you might know because of quantum mechanics some of you or probably many of you or all of you don't know that he was living in Dublin for a while and he was the head of the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies which is still existing actually and he, he was one of the possibly the first guy in charge or among those and they do still study fundamental sciences and so on so they he was he was around for a while in Dublin actually so what he's saying and he gave actually a very fundamental uh, lecture about um, the relation between uh, physics and biology if you're interested it's like what is life so if you're interested in knowing more about that have a look because it's it's worth a read um, so he's saying the living matter while not eluding the laws of physics might is likely to involve other laws which will form just as integral a part of its science so what it means is that the guy did not reject the basic law of physics okay the guy was one of the main contributors to discovering uh, part of them right uh, but He's saying maybe that's not it, okay? Maybe there is more depending, for example, on the, uh, in a sense, the magnifying glass with which you look at things on the scale, okay? Um, so uh, the approach actually that says that you don't need anything else than the laws of physics is called uh, reductionist. Hmm? And it simply says, uh, okay, you have the law of physics, right now we have four, 
theories, right? We don't have so many laws to obey to, and that's all we need. Now, the problem is, and that's the functionalist uh, opposition, uh, how comes, um, you know, you have, uh, if you, like, there, are, th there is something else, I think, okay? So there are some higher level behaviors, like, for example, the emergent one, okay, that are very difficult to reconduce, you know, to these um, low level uh, laws. Even if you look at physics itself, there is a part of physics which studies the big things relativity and there is a part of physics that studies the very small things quantum mechanics and then you have some physics is working in more or less in between like Newtonian physics so even if you don't realize it you're already saying you're already admitting that there is a scale factor right you have a completely different theory for each of these scales so already even with the current laws of physics scale plays a role okay so anyway um, uh, what they what some people claim is that it it can all be understood and reconduced to the same you know body of uh, of laws talking about abstractions okay levels of abstraction um so in the in the reductionist approach uh, what what the people say and that's like the classical way uh, uh to approach science there are only a few forces of nat nature few and small now and the number n might change with time, but we don't expect it will change too much, right? Um, while some people that support the concept of strong emergence, they say that actually um, new forces of nature might appear if you consider different levels of emergence and abstraction, okay? And they claim this might be a way to actually kind of, you know, reconduce to, the, to a unique body of knowledge the different partial understanding we have of different scales and it might also lead to explain why we cannot understand fully things like the Mandelbrot set, um, the chaotic uh, weather, um, and you know things like emergence. We don't We don't have an equation telling how uh, you know uh, certain local behaviors lead to some global behaviors. At best, we have some statistical understanding, the statistical mechanics. So, how comes if everything is related to the laws of physics? The, the ones we know now uh, that we don't predict weather, right? Uh, so there are some actually gray zones uh, in in the scientific uh, studies that you know might be due to the fact we have a too narrow view on things. Okay, again, this philosophy now is not even science, right? So I don't have a very strong opinion about this. I think. Um, there is there are some aspects where the reductionist approach even in the design of systems won't probably help too much but it has been tremendously successful so far all of the science and technology around us is likely is most likely due to uh, a reductionist uh, classical science approach there are other things though when you have a feedback when you have an adaptivity when you have evolution i think there is still a lot to do and it might be too difficult or not a good idea to just adopt the usual tools so all of these new gray zones or these parts of the reality we don't fully understand are in a sense the realm of complex systems, okay? So it's much more than what I'm going to talk about in the next few days. But you know, from next lecture, we are going to basically zoom in to um, some more specific aspects related to what we do. And also we are going to basically handpick some aspects of complex systems. So we are not going to study all of them because there are too many to cover in few lectures. Okay, any question? Yes. Okay. So you said that uh, many things are unknown. Yes. So it may be that uh, uh, those things which are unknown, they are they are individually unknown, and when we connect it yes. in the future, they.